Today I'm starting a new series talking about the best board games I've played in a month. I get the chance to try a lot of new games, but I don't have the time to cover all of them on the channel, so I wanted to focus on the ones worth talking about. But if you want to know about the six games I've played that didn't make this list and what I thought of them, you can find out in my monthly newsletter that is exclusive to my Patreon backers. See the link below. Before I start, I just want to share some happy personal news with you. Earlier this month, I got married to Serena, my partner of 14 years. We had a small ceremony outdoors on a hill in Edinburgh in Scotland. And as you might imagine, it chucked it down, but it just added to the spectacle at all. It was an amazing day. We had an incredible time. And then we spent the week up there watching uh, shows at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, comedy shows and plays, which is one of our favorite things to do together. Uh, thank you to everyone that's already wished us congratulations on Twitter. And now that Serena is legally bound to me, I'm going to try and get her in a video on Actual Law at some point in the future. But I just wanted to share that with you because it's just one of the best things that's ever happened to me. So uh, let's get on with the list. In Overbooked, you're running your own airline, trying to seat passengers onto a plane so that all your customers are happy. On your turn, you take a card from the gate. This shows you the type of passengers you have to find seats for and how you have to arrange them on the plane. You can rotate the card, but they have to stay in that formation. And that's where the puzzle lies. If you don't want to take the first group of passengers, you give them a free meal voucher and take the next card. As the game goes on, those vouchers become vital to avoid cards that will screw up your plans. Because if you take a card that forces you to place a passenger on top of an occupied seat, you've overbooked them and the existing seat holder will be dragged kicking and screaming from the plane to give you some free publicity on social media. It feels a bit like a Tetris game as you try to find the right shape to fit your puzzle. What's cool is that each type of passenger scores in a different way, so you're trying to get certain people sitting next to each other. These red lovebirds want to be sat in couples. Two next to each other is worth five points, but three's a crowd, so if you introduce a gooseberry to the equation, you score no points for any of them. These blue tiles represent players on a rugby team who all desperately want to sit together, no doubt for some polite conversation. You'll score points for your biggest collection of them, so you'll be trying to get them all in the same aisle and adjacent to each other. Plus, you get double points if your group of egg chasers is bigger than any other players. The green tiles are senior citizens traveling together, and the yellow tiles are groups of friends. They all want to be sat next to each other too, and they score just like the rugby players. Finally, you have to deal with the children because no one's invented an adults-only airline yet. They can't be left alone, so to score three points for them, you need to surround them on all sides by responsible adults. Whether or not they're their parents doesn't seem to matter. Those simple point-scoring rules bring the right amount of challenge as you try to pick cards with the right passengers in the right places, and I love that they bring some thematic flavor to what is an abstract game at heart. They make sense in the context of the theme, so they're easy to remember, and there's a player reference to remind you anyway. Some of the passenger cards offer less passengers, but have strict instructions about whether they want a window seat, an aisle seat, or whether they'd prefer to sit in the middle of the row because they're a masochist. These cards are more flexible, but you'll lose points at the end of the game for empty seats, so you have to take quantity over quality sometimes. Overbooked is a gloriously simple game to get into, but with enough thinkiness to keep me satisfied. You will want to spend more time arranging your passengers than in your average Tetris game, but we found that you can keep resolving your card while the next players take their turns, and it keeps the game snappy. As the game goes on, you'll be cursing the cards available and getting into hot water with overbooking. It has that taste of spatial sadism that I love in roll and write games like Railroad Inc. and Avenue. I really dig the quirky theme because we can all relate to it and make jokes around the table about it. The artwork is wonderful with such colourful characters for each separate passenger on your plane. The whole game is full of cute visual touches that just bring the theme to life. There's advanced variants such as event cards which add some different ways to score extra points each game that slots in perfectly to add just a little more depth. I'm keeping overbooked around and giving it a seal of actual love. It reminds me of games I love, but does things differently enough, is light on setup and rules, and has a theme and a look that make me proud to own it. Pandemic Rapid Response is the latest game in the Pandemic franchise, except this one is more than a remix of the original. It's a completely different game. It is cooperative, but unlike Pandemic, it's played in real time, with you racing against a sand timer. It also isn't designed by Matt Leacock, but by Kane Klenko, who brings real-time dice game pedigree 
with his game's fuse and flatline. And the theme isn't quite the same either. Instead of curing disease, you're playing as relief workers on board a plane delivering aid to cities across the globe. You have to produce the aid that each city requires, fly to that city and deliver it. Everything you do in the game is done with dice. To collect the resources you need, such as water or medicine, you need to roll the right symbols and deliver them to the specific room. But you can only submit them if you have enough to fill the next available space. Once dice are on the board, they're locked in until someone activates the room. You get way more resources if you can fill it up fully, so you'll want to collaborate to make it happen and so that players can free up their dice to use them for other things. If you don't roll what you want, you get two opportunities to re-roll any of your dice. I like that an unwelcome dice roll creates this immediate crisis that you have to manage. How can you rethink your turn so that it isn't a complete waste? One clever twist of this real-time game is that instead of all playing at once, you take it in turns to roll your dice and do your actions. If someone takes too long working out how to use their dice, they're holding up the whole operation. It takes the immense pressure of playing against the timer up another notch. But it also adds a feeling of collaboration that you don't get in other real-time games. While the other players are forced to wait for their turn, they can help you by suggesting options and reminding you of what's needed as your brain melts under the pressure. It brings you together as a team because you're in constant discussion, and if you're not in constant discussion, you're wasting your strongest asset and you'll probably lose. Once you activate rooms, the resources you produce go into the cargo hold. You'll need to spend airplane symbols to fly to the right city, then another one to deliver, spend the cubes and complete the card. Complete all the cities before you run out of time and you win the game. If the time runs out first, you lose the game. You can also lose the game if you don't deal with your waste. Every time you activate a room, the waste track will go up and you need to focus your time and dice on clearing it out or it will get you. None of what you're doing makes a lot of sense for the theme. Why are we having to create water on a plane? How do you create water on a plane? How many Hollywood films have had their heroes almost succumb to the perils of too much waste? I really wish that the board was a hospital ward of patients that we're racing against time to keep alive. But where the explanations are a bit hazy, the feel of the game does a great job of capturing the stress and teamwork that the theme is going for. And that's why it deserves to be in the pandemic line. It's simple, it's exciting, it's incredibly easy to teach and set up. And you won't be making accidental rules mistakes like in some real-time games. And if you find it too easy, it has a clever way to keep things tricky with a deck of crisis cards that present new obstacles every time you flip the timer. This is now my favorite Kane Clanko real-time dice game because it doesn't have the punishing luck of Fuse and I much prefer the whole game being played against a timer unlike Flatline. I wasn't expecting to embrace a pandemic game that messed with the original formula, but Rapid Response is a really fun real-time game that deserves its place in the franchise. And another test of the age-old question, how many pandemic board games can one man reasonably own? <laughs> Guardian's Call is a bluffing game that is built around one of my favorite mechanisms. If you've played Cockroach Poker before, you'll know how it works. On your turn, you have to make an offer of cards to another player. Let's say I tell them I'm offering two artifacts. They have to decide whether I'm telling the truth or lying, with little more info than the look on my face and the way I said it. And if they're lucky, a lifelong friendship and understanding of how my eyebrow twitches when I'm lying. Their job is to say, yes, that's two artifacts, or no, that's not artifacts, you're lying. I reveal the cards, and if they guess right, they get to keep them. So you can be telling the truth and still be punished for it because you were too easy to read. If they get it wrong and you successfully misled them, you get to keep the cards. It's the ultimate pure bluffing experience and watch my eyebrows, I don't love it. What Guardian's Call has done is added an extra layer of deduction to it. Each type of card scores points in different ways, so there are now incentives to choosing certain cards. Gaining villager cards will move you along the council track and you want to be ahead on that to score more points than the other players. So if I tell someone I'm offering up villager cards to them, they have information about how likely I am to want them. Or maybe I'm brazenly taunting them by offering the type of card they're desperate for in the hope they'll guess I'm telling the truth. If they were paying attention, they could have seen which cards I picked up from the draw selection at the start of my turn. Maybe some of them are in this offer. And each player has character-specific incentives to collect certain cards. None of this information makes anything more certain, but it gives you more to think about and even more room to misdirect people by going with or against the obvious move. 
If someone can trick you with one of these curse cards, they can remove or steal one of your cards. So the stakes are high. And after a few losses, you'll be staring at them desperately trying to read their micro expressions to avoid another embarrassment. On the downside of things, I can't buy into the theme of Guardian's Call. Cool. It's too elaborate for such a simple game and I can't make it fit the mechanisms in my head. I do like that the offer cards score in different ways, but there's a little too much extra going on around that with the coins and quest cards and treasure cards. Even still, Guardian's Call cool is a lot of fun, largely because it's based on such a brilliant core concept and it adds a little bit more in terms of deduction for gamers to get stuck into. Atelier, the painter studio, is an engine building game from AEG, which has you painting famous paintings to get the most points. Because if you're not going to make any money as an artist, you may as well get points. The way you do everything in the game is through your dice. On your turn, you roll all your dice, and what you get will determine which actions you can take. Ones and twos allow you to place one of your assistants by a certain color of paint. It doesn't guarantee you'll get any of that paint, but you'll be placing assistants down to try and get the majority in certain colors for when you play a four die, which allows you to collect paint from the colors where you have the majority. Threes allow you to move assistants around to reshuffle the majorities. You can move one assistant owned by each player, so usually you'll send your opponent's assistants to a color you don't care about. It's a little more interactive than you'd expect from a Euro game, and some players might not enjoy having their plans mess with like this, but there's always sixes which allow you to take any color of your choice. Turns are quite flexible. You can spend all your dice at once if you rolled perfectly, pulling off a neat move where you place assistance, collect the paint you need, and paint a painting all in one go. This does lend itself to some downtime as players take an epic turn, and if you prematurely splurge your dice all over the canvas in turn one, you'll just be sat there waiting for everyone else to finish, having suddenly lost all your desire to paint. If you didn't roll what you wanted this turn, you can just take one action now, let the round continue, and then you'll get to re-roll at the start of your next turn. I really like the dice action system because it creates some excitement for whether you'll get to carry out your plan, and often forces you to rethink and take another route. As the game progresses, you'll find more ways to mitigate the luck of the dice, so it never feels unbearably harsh. Fives on the dice allow you to paint a painting. You pay the colors printed on the card and get it in front of you. Timing can be very important as someone might be aiming for the same card as you. Each painting you paint gives you points, but more importantly becomes part of your engine, giving you a powerful special ability that makes you better at your job. They bring the game alive with ways to get free paint each round and mitigate dice results. The lower scoring cards are much more powerful, so you have to balance building up your strength with racing to finish paintings and score hard points because the game ends when someone finishes three masterpieces and it can catch you by surprise. These inspiration tokens give you the option to re-roll dice if you really want to take a specific action right now, or you can save them up to take a painting action or draw a new patron card. Patrons are secret objectives that will score you extra points for collecting certain types of paintings, and another thing to consider when planning your moves. I was really impressed by Atelier. It has that satisfying progression that all great engine building games have, it doesn't quite hit my sweet spot on the graph of thinkiness versus player interaction, but if you like lighter Euro games, then you should definitely give this one a try. 20 Second Showdown is a party game that feels like a TV game show. You play on two teams, yellow and blue. You take it in turns to complete challenges before the timer runs out. If it runs out on your team's turn, the other team wins. One person is the games master. They control this massive sand timer and read out the challenges. Each team has a baton which they pass amongst themselves to track whose turn it is to complete a challenge. The games master reads it out. For example, take a sock off and put it on your hand to make a sock puppet. Make it say, hello, I'm Socky McSockface. <laughs> and then the player has to do that as fast as possible. Another one is flick the earlobe of everyone on your team or recite the ring around the roses rhyme without using the letter S. The quicker they can do it, the more pressure they put on the rivals because the sand timer flips over sooner and the other team will have less time to work with. The brilliance of the game is in these challenges which are so wonderfully weird and varied that you never know what to expect next. You might have to stick an object to a nearby wall, which for us was a crushed jelly bean. You might have to perform a marriage ceremony for two other players or answer some basic trivia. I love that they get you up on your feet using the room you're in and involving the other players. They're silly, yeah, you have to be willing to give in to its silliness, but they're never trying to force you to do anything awkward or annoying like some lazy party games do. 
and being part of the team and knowing that your slowness or failure will lose your team the game just makes it so much more exciting. I wasn't expecting to love 20 Second Showdown, but I love 20 Second Showdown. It was the smash hit of our party games night. It has such a fun energy that makes you feel like a kid again. It isn't designed for gamers, it isn't clever, it's just a ton of fun, and I can't wait to bring it out again. Plus, it gets a seal of actual love. Red Peak is a real-time cooperative game about running away from an erupting volcano. We start at base camp, right next to the volcano. Not sure whose idea that was. The goal is to make a path through the jungle to the safety of this boat before the trail of lava catches up with you. During the daytime, you plan your route through the jungle as quickly as possible. You each have a hand of tool cards that you must spend to move through the icons on these tiles, so you have to discuss which tile is your best option and how you'll work together to achieve it. You'll be shouting, I've got a spade, has anyone got a machete? Each card has three tools on it, but can only be used for one. It's a clever way of getting players cooperating and coordinating because you can't see each other's cards and everyone is vital to the plan. No one can take over and tell everyone else what to do. You have to plan out your tiles before you play any of the cards, so make sure you don't promise one card for two different tiles. And it's up to you as a group when you stop selecting tiles and start playing the cards to move yourselves along the trail. You have to make your plan before you carry it out. It plays into your natural desire to want to get as much done as possible before the volcano erupts again. But if you push your luck and leave it too late, you won't get it done before the timer ends and you'll lose another 90 seconds for going over. It should be straightforward. You can just pick the tiles that have the tools on that you have. You just need to work together, but that time pressure will get to you and force silly mistakes. In the evening, you resolve the other part of the tiles which reward you with new cards, more path tiles to choose from, and lives to your sand timer. But they can also come with volcano icons, which means you have to draw a lava tile and add it to the path. What's great about the path tiles is that there's no surprises. You can plan to use the tiles that give you more tool cards when you need them, and avoid volcanoes as much as possible. But if you desperately need a corner tile this round, you might have no choice. If you want more cards or tiles, the game does allow you to make a deal with the devil to get them. You can have more, in exchange for drawing another lava tile. Every time I've played Red Peak, it came down to the wire. It's a fun take on real-time cooperative games that is elegantly simple. It might feel a bit samey after a while, but I think that the theme and the gameplay make it a solid pick for families and anyone looking for a light real-time co-op game. Those are my favorite board games of this month. I've put links to where you can buy them in the description below. If you want to learn about the other games I played this month and what I thought of them, support me on Patreon, just like Ryan Moore does. Thank you so much to Ryan. And if you want to follow this new series, make sure to subscribe. I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching.